Um, today, what we can do is talk about the intersection of weight loss with insulin resistance or weight loss with diabetes, because that's always a fascinating topic, and I know our audience really cares about that. So oh, in, in a recent webinar that you gave about intermittent fasting, which I was um, part of, you covered research that said that the most effective way to lose weight is to do it over the course of time by developing about a 300 to 500 calorie deficit on a daily basis. So can you share with our listeners, how do you know this to be true, and uh, how can somebody actually achieve this calorie gap every day? Yeah, so that's uh, the current recommendation. Um, from authoritative bodies is that what we should shoot for now that's only because there's a, such an increase in boost in appetite with any sort of caloric restriction that's why they want people to cut literally hundreds of calories out of their daily diet not because people will actually achieve it because your appetite will come raging back but with that much caloric drop then even with a boosted appetite the hope is they're gonna you're gonna maintain a gap um, uh, that uh, will uh, over time continue the loss of body fat now, the, there's lots of ways you can do it. The traditional way has been portion control. You just eat less food. Um, and so, look, if you have a 2,000-calorie you know, diet and uh, you want to cut 500 calories, you eat uh, one quarter less. Um, but the problem is that's not sustainable. Um, uh, people, so, and that's why they've been shown to fail time and time again with these you know, calorie-controlled diets is because people are, you know, you can white-knuckle it for a while, but people are hungry. People eat the amount of food because that's how much they, they want to eat of that amount of food. And to constantly, consciously eat less food, you can do it for a few months, but people, uh, it's been a really uh, sad, disappointing failure. So instead of decreasing the quantity of food, I encourage people to increase the quality of food. So for example, brings up uh, one of my 17 ingredients for an optimal weight loss diet is uh, low in calorie density. So some foods have different amounts of calories per mouthful, per forkful, per stomachful than others. Um, and so if you just pack your stomach absolutely to bursting with a variety of whole healthy plant foods like fruits and vegetables, you're, you're taking in so few calories that you could get stuffed all day long, eat pounds of food and still lose weight. You can eat more food and lose weight um, because you're actually get, taking in uh, fewer calories. Um, and so that's decreasing the intake of, uh, you know, of uh, the acronym CRAP, calorie rich and processed foods. So that's, uh, you know, uh, meats, cheeses, sugars, you know, uh, you know uh, all that processed junk out there. That's where the calories really concentrated. And by, you know, moving to, you know, whole grains, beans, uh, fruits and vegetables, um, then you can actually end up eating the same amount of food, lose weight, eat more amount of food, lose weight. And I talk about some of the amazing studies that showed that uh, how uh, fast and sustainably one can do that without feeling hungry because you're just uh, stuffing yourself to the gills. Now, weight loss often comes along with some unwanted side effects, including reduced muscle mass. So most people want to lose fat, not muscle. How can you minimize muscle loss while losing weight? Yeah, so resistance exercise. So you can dramatically cut down the loss of lean body. Mass. Now, you, you don't have to exercise while, I mean, you could lose weight and then you can bulk up. Um, uh, I mean, no reason you have to do it simultaneously. But if you don't want to lose uh, muscle mass while you're um, uh, uh, during caloric restriction, uh, res resistance exercise um, can uh, dramatically decrease um, uh, the, uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, lean body ma mass loss. But even in people that don't, so for example, the famous calorie trial, um, which is the longest, largest study, um, a randomized controlled study of a caloric restriction to date, um, showed that um, even though there was a loss of lean body mass, um, the, the muscular strength per body, for body weight, I mean, so their relative strength actually went up. So even though they lost lean body mass, and so they actually lost muscle strength, well, compared to their total body weight, they actually were stronger than they were before, even with that loss. But if you want to preserve it and not have to bulk back up as much, um, then yeah, um, combining resistance exercise um, with, um, with uh, caloric restriction will uh, prevent the, uh, the bulk of the lean body mass loss. So, so what you're saying effectively is that their strength to weight ratio, is that right? Um, yeah, so yeah. Up, it actually improves yeah. So in terms of their torque, in terms of their, I, I mean, so, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's good for you anyway. Okay, so people who perform intermittent fasting or calorie restriction, sometimes they don't even know what's the best time to exercise. Sometimes, you know, there's a lot of folklore about you should do it before a fast, you should do it during a fast, you should do it after a fast in order to maximize fat loss. What's the truth? The truth depends on whether you're diabetic or not. 
If you're not diabetic, then, eat, then exercising before eating is the way to go. You want a six hour fast before exercise. Typically, that pretty much means for most people before breakfast is the only time they're actually going six hours without eating is before breakfast. If, however, you time it right, you, and have an early enough breakfast, you can do a late lunch, exercise before lunch, or a late dinner, exercise before dinner. But for most people, that would mean exercising before breakfast, significant um, improvement in body fat loss. Um, unfortunately, if you just do it uh, like three times a week or something, you're, you lose more body fat that day, but your body <laughs> puts on more fat in the days you're not exercising. So the only way this is actually gonna work is if you consistently exercise more days than not. So at least four days a week, ideally every day, but uh, then you can really see the difference in terms of before versus after meals. In diabetics, it's the opposite. And the, what we want to do um, is exercise, um, ideally, you know, 30 minutes after starting eating, ideally for an hour to completely straddle the blood sugar spike. Um, we would do that ideally at the, at, the, at the largest meal of the day, which ideally would be the breakfast meal earlier in the day. Larger meals would be better terms of a better blood sugar control or ideally after every meal. So, I mean, the idea, my ideal diabetes um, exercise regimen would be three hours a day after every meal. Like, I mean, that would be, I mean, that, that would be, that would be the way to just burn off those sugars right when you're right, right when they're right when they're peaking up. Um, but obviously that's, that's impractical for most people, but largest meal of the day exercising after would be the best for diabetics. So some people who lose weight find that their LDL cholesterol and or triglycerides increase. Why does this occur and is it worth worrying about or not? Um, so, uh, I mean, if you dramatic, I mean, like, so if you're water only fast, I mean, if you dramatically cut your calories, then you get such rapid weight loss that you're pouring fat and cholesterol into your bloodstream from your stomach, from your hips, from your butt. Like, I mean, you're, so the, the fat in your, in your bloodstream um is is from all this fat dissolution from this fatty breakdown and you actually get a bump in insulin resistance too because all of a sudden you have all this fat in your blood even if you're not taking it in your mouth you're um uh, you know it's coming off your body but that's temporary and that'll go away um uh, and level out um but if you're doing more moderate calorie restriction and losing weight at a more steady pace your ldl cholesterol should go down in fact it goes down about on average about a point per pound uh, it comes out to be about that. And so if you're like, <clears throat> eat a really, so let's say you're a really healthy plant-based diet, you're doing everything right, and your LDL is still, you know, 90 or something. We really wanted to get it under 70. This is assuming primary prevention. You've never had a heart attack, never had a stroke. You're not doing secondary prevention, trying to prevent a second heart attack, in which case we want to get your LDL down farther, 50 or lower. But um, if, as far as you know, you have no heart disease yet, uh, no heart disease diagnosis, LDL target is 70. Let's say you're at 90 and you're doing everything right. You're not eating uh, dietary cholesterol because you're eating a plant-based diet. You're not eating trans fats because you're eating all that junk. You, uh, you know, you're not eating saturated fats um, in large quantities. So you're not eating tropical oils. You're not eating uh, meat and dairy. Um, and still your cholesterol levels aren't enough. And you're even adding healthy foods to your diet, like, uh, like the portfolio diet from you know, Jenkins and University of Toronto you know, eating lots of viscous, soluble fiber containing foods like slimy foods, okra, oatmeal, eggplant, nuts, all sorts of these things that lower your, that drop your, that actively pull cholesterol from your body. You do all that and you're still LDL 90 or something. Maybe you have a bad family history and you know, your liver's just churning out cholesterol. Well, you lose 20 pounds, you can get down to seven, you know, and the average American is overweight. Um, and so, you know, you can say, oh, I need to lose 15 points. All right, I need to lose 15 pounds. Um, and that should do it. And that's by any means. Um, and that's why um, sometimes you can put people on these horrible diets, these low carb diets, um, just like if you gave them tuberculosis or a meth habit or whatever, um, they lose weight. They, sometimes they can drop their LDL. Um, uh, and they're like, look, hey, I'm, I'm eating bacon and my cholesterol is dropping. Um, but obviously, um, uh, that's uh, not doing their bodies any favors in the long run.